Welcome to the One Away Show, presented by B. Debbie Missions. I am Brian Wish, and I am your host, and thanks so much for being here. On this show, I sit down with compelling entrepreneurs, authors, and rising leaders to talk through their most transformative relationships, experiences, and epiphanies. Curated with entrepreneurial leaders in mind, we'll dig into these finite moments in people's lives and understand how they helped set their path forward. David Sherman is the CEO of Lowline, the leading provider of online continuing legal education, CLE, in the country. The company recently celebrated serving over 130,000 attorneys with over 3 million courses completed. David is also the past president of Entrepreneurs Organization New York. David is the author of the book, The Fast Forward Mindset, How to Become Fearless and Focused to Accelerate Your Success. This book shows a very simple formula to consistently break through your walls and fast forward your entrepreneurial success and happiness. He recently gave a TEDx youth talk to high school students to inspire them to reach their full potential in life. He is also a frequent speaker to business organizations, colleges, and high schools on topics ranging from entrepreneurship, mindset, leadership, and culture, and has published articles on these topics in Forbes. His success has been recognized by his peers in entrepreneurship and in the legal industry, and has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Inc. Magazine, Entrepreneur, Cranes New York, the New York Post, and Law.com. Lastly, David has a love for adventure and discovery. He has run several marathons. He has hiked mountains of Patagonia, paraglided in Colorado, gone skydiving, and taking flying lessons. He currently lives in Spain with his wife, Kelly, and three beautiful children. David, welcome to the One Away Show. What's up, Brian? Good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Uh, everything over the last couple of years. Uh, some fascinating stories that you have, David. So tell us, what are uh, what's your One Away moment that you want to share with us today? Be- before I do that, I want to say we are still in the COVID world, so and there's some quarantine going on. So if you hear kids in the background, that's all part of the fun <laughs> of this podcast. So we all know who was alive at that time and old enough where we were on 9-11. It's just one of those things that stick into your, in your memory. And for me, uh, I was on my, I was, I remember being on, going to work in Midtown Manhattan, seeing the flames or the smoke coming from the towers because it was all the way downtown, but you could see it. And I was still heading to work. And I remember thinking like, oh my God, this is crazy. And you can hear jets, you know, flying by as they were coming. And I get to work and I remember thinking, wow, this is going to be a really bad day, but they're going to put the fire out and it's going to be sort of a normal day, but a really bad day. And the moment that the, the towers fell and, you know, we, we read about it online and we heard about it, I looked at my boss and I said, I need to leave now. I got up and I left and I didn't come back for a couple of days. And I knew at that moment, everything changed. And in fact, for me, everything changed for my career because I lived right next to the armory on, in Midtown in, on 27th and 3rd. My, my girlfriend, now my wife at the time, and I was staying at her place. And that was the armory that they used for all the missing people. And so over the next couple of days, when I didn't go to work, you saw all these posters up all over the fences surrounding the armory, picture after picture of missing family members or friends, which of course now we know all were dead. And it was such a sad scene and you just walk through there. And I just remember feeling, you know, when I got back to work a couple of days later, I was in sales. It was my second sales job since I graduated college. So this is 2001, I graduated in 1999 and I didn't like what I was doing. And I sort of felt like I was just going through the motions and I just realized like, you know, life is short. You got to really do what you want to do. And I had this vision where I started seeing 20 years in the future. I started seeing myself at my seventh sales job and my eighth sales job, you know, switching back and forth because for my first job out of college, that's what all the senior guys had been this is their third or fourth or fifth sales job. And many of them felt stuck. And I knew right then I didn't want to get stuck in that 
routine. And so uh, pretty soon thereafter, I quit my job. And when I quit my job, I didn't have another job lined up. And of course I needed money. So what did I do? I became a real estate salesperson in New York City. So I'll, I'll pause there for a moment. But that, that sort of what shifted to where I am today. I think a lot of people can uh, relate to that moment of feeling where when they kind of look down the line and kind of look at their life, they realize that that's not what they wanted uh, or what they want for themselves, which is, I think, a clear indication of you saying, you know, I have to leave. My, my question for you was, if it wasn't for 9-11 uh, or, or before 9-11, were you taking a hard look in the mirror? Did you kind of know something was off then? Or was 9-11 the moment that made you realize, you know what, maybe I should think a little more deeply about my life? So I, I knew something was off before then. It's, it's why I switched to my second job. And it's why after every sales job I had, I worked really hard the first six months to a year and I did really well. And then just sort of got comfortable. And I always knew like in my heart that I would be successful. I'd be an entrepreneur or something like that. I just knew it. I didn't feel like I was on that path. And I remember my dad, who is a mentor to me, but you know, sometimes dads say condescending things to you unintentionally. I remember when I was in the sales job and it was like third or fourth year at you know, second company, and, he, and he, all he wanted me to do, which we'll talk about in a few moments, is go to law school. And he, and he looks at me and he's like, it's gonna be interesting to see where you end up. Hmm. And I was like, damn, gee, uh, that was kind of low, but I, you know, I was like, yeah, I guess it will be. Uh, because I was not where I wanted to be um, from from many levels. I was enjoying it. Uh, in my first my first job, I enjoyed it. Was like college. It was like the perfect step up from college, but not. It was good, but I just had to figure out how I was going to you know have a career and not just job after job after job. Totally, totally, uh, David. Before before the call, you you mentioned something about when you were in your sales jobs uh, before before law school, before we talk about that. You said when you look down at people who are senior salespeople in the company, maybe 20 years down the line, they've been in the industry for a while. You said that you could just tell they felt stuck and you realized that you didn't want to be that person, right? So I, how did, what, what gave you, how did you have that insight that they were stuck? What gave you the insight to say, I don't want to be that person in 15, 20 years? And to be clear, well, this is some of them were not stuck. Some of them enjoyed what they were doing, and that's that was the role that they had. Um, I, I, I just knew deep down inside, I wanted. I think this is what I knew, that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, and I knew sales was becoming a great experience. But I also knew, like, so that company had three or reorganizations while I was there. It was a public company. And they, they fired people, they reshifted people. And every time I survived and it moved up and just became de so de-energizing, hmm. you know, what's, what's going to happen next? And of course the whole, uh, you know, I don't know if this is before your sort of, you were, you were in the business world, but like 1999 was the first real sort of recession or the dot-com bubble burst. And so there was a lot of challenges then. And so that was part of it as well. But I, um, I wasn't growing uh, enough and, and it could have been me. It could have been other things, but I, I just knew uh, I had to shift my focus. And one of the things that I learned early on from people who kept shifting is every time you got a new job, you generally got a 20 to 30% bump, at least back then, because you kind of said you made more money and then they paid you more money. And then it was easier to make more money by shifting jobs than getting promoted in, in your own company. So that's what I did. Totally. And just for context, what, how old were you? at this time. So my first, I guess I was 23, 24. Got it. So you, you did these couple sales jobs. You realized this, this wasn't uh, the path for you and there's something different. You had your dad questioning what you were doing, kind of demoralizing in certain ways and realizing, you know what, I should make a change. What, what was next for you? So I went straight into becoming a real estate broker, a real estate salesperson, I should say, because a broker is a, the next level. And within a couple months, uh, I figured out how to go on Craigslist. Back then it was like just the beginning. 
and I became one of the top uh, salespeople in the office. Actually, one of my first apartments that I, I rented was to Nikki Hilton, who was Paris Hilton's sister, and her boyfriend, uh, Brian McFadden, who was a DJ on MTV. And I got a pretty big commission from that. And I got a couple other big commissions. And uh, it was going well. But soon thereafter, similar to my first job, I sort of, after a couple, maybe six months, sort of got comfortable and wasn't pushing myself as hard. And the big light bulb moment for me was thinking back to the real estate exam because you needed to take an exam to become a salesperson. How much energy and enjoyment I got out of studying for the exam because a lot of it was there's law that you had to do it and then taking in the learning aspect. And so I really held on to that. And I realized if I wanted to stop, because being in real estate was another sales job. So it was, again, just switching from sales. I, I decided, yes, I wanted to be an entrepreneur someday, but it was better to have a career for the next 30 years and do something that can have an impact than and have direction. And so I made the decision to take the LSTATs for law school. And the reason that's, that's interesting is because ever since I was in high school, my dad came from very little money and worked his way up and got a full scholarship to New York Law School and helped him build the life that he has. So all he ever wanted for me was to do that and go to law school. And it was not something I was interested in until I was, I guess, ready for it on my own. And it made sense. And as soon as I decided I wanted to go to law school, I put all of my energy into doing that. And, and I was able to do it. Before we talk about law school and in the, the next step, I'm, I'm, in, I'm curious, it sounded like all along you knew you wanted to be an entrepreneur, make an impact. So as you were doing the sales, sales jobs that ultimately that you realized, you know, I don't want to do this. What would you say the top two, three, four things you learned from those jobs that have helped you as an entrepreneur today? I 100% say, 100% say to everybody, if you can do a sales job for a year, you know, for a couple of years, I learned so much about myself um, and my skill level. So a couple of things that, that sort of stuck out to me is being a salesperson, it's completely being an entrepreneur because, and that's what I liked about it because you make your own, you figure out what you want, you figure out who the leads are, you make your own calls, you make your own, you determine how much money you're gonna make and the rush of actually closing the sale is so exciting. So I realized sales is a big create, creative sport. Number two, obviously you gotta to learn to deal with rejection. And there's a lot of obviously self-help books on that that talk about, look, you're no different after the rejection than you were first. So rejection is not real. But we actually had Dale Carnegie training for us. And like we literally, the guy, the, the trainer would come in, he would tell us to stand up when we called, smile, stare at ourselves in the mirror. And we did all those techniques. And I think dealing with rejection, figuring out how to get through the right person, the rush of the sale, um, the, the making call after call, figuring out how to iterate on your email till you finally get through that. Those are skills that I use to, to today. And the question is, is it, um, you know, nature versus nurture? Does the sales roles attract people who are naturally like doing that? Or did that help build that up? And cer certainly it's somewhere in between. But I, I even to this day, Lawline, uh, I, I, I rely on my old skills in, in sales as I, you know, work on sales here sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. I, my parents always told me the same thing, how everybody should work a sales job and, and get that experience. And sounds like it's benefited you as you have built a pretty successful company uh, at Lawline. So David, you went to, uh, to law school from these experiences. My, my question would be, what happened in law school? I mean, when you, when you said, you know what, this is what I'm going to do next, to give a really clear vision that you are eventually going to start a business or was it more of an exploratory period to really figure it out? And, and somehow you, you ended up starting a business a few years later. Like what, what, what happened in law school that was pivotal or transformational for you? So no, going to law school, my thought was I was going to be a lawyer, you know, you don't go to law school, you know, most people don't go to law school unless they're going to be, have a career as a lawyer. I didn't know what type of law I wanted to do. All I knew was I did not want to work for my dad in any shape or form, just because I knew it wouldn't work. 
um, and he was in personal injury. It wasn't certainly some in the area that I was interested in. He was very passionate about it. He looked at himself as uh, Robin Hood, getting from the rich insurance companies and helping the poor. And he had this vision, which is so smart. And like I, all these things that he did, I always registered in my head, like for myself. So I would say there's there's two things that really stood out to me. I did two different internships, uh, one at a judge and then one at a law firm when I was in law school. And of course, I was a little bit older than most of the, the students because I had worked for four years and a lot of law students were straight out of college. And I realized law school was like just an extension of college for most people. But law school doesn't really teach you how to be a lawyer, just sort of teaches you arguments and case law and, and it's kind of not helpful. Um, and, but what I realized when I started doing these internships at different law firms, <laughs> I realized a lawyer is actually no different. It's a lawyer who wants to be successful in a way or wants to, to grow is no different than a salesperson, except the one key ingredient. Now they actually have to do the work of a lawyer. Uh, of course, if you're a transactional lawyer at a firm, it's different. But if you're like trying to start your own law firm, and it was a lot more work. And I wasn't shying away from that, but I also didn't know where I wanted to go. And so the two things that sort of happened during law school that led to, to law line was one, I, I worked at a law firm over the summer and I didn't have a good experience. And I just let the, the lawyer I was working under know that I was not going to come back. And he essentially berated me um, and the whole office heard and he kicked me out of the office that moment. And it was so humiliating I remember walking out and just being like, damn, I, I, I never want to be treated. First of all, I would never treat anyone like that. I never want to be treated like that. And it just really was like, you know, recognizing like being a lawyer, like especially at a firm, you're just starting from the bottom and building your way up. And the second thing was um, sort of at the same time, I started a online TV show and a public access TV show and also put it online called True NYC. And this was just part of my passion. I was trying to understand who all these entrepreneurs were who started their businesses. And it was starting that show that not only I built my network and sort of transformed who I am today, which we, I'm sure we'll get into in a moment, but also led me to realizing I could do the same video experience, gear it towards lawyers and turn that into courses. And that became the light bulb moment, like to take that idea my dad had tried in 1999, but wasn't successful and turn it into a full-time business my third year of law school. Was, was there anybody, as you were on this journey, you started this TV show, was, was there anyone on this journey that you, know, you learned the most from that helped you, saw something in you that maybe pushed you to start a business? It sounds, it sounds like a lot of incredible education that you received from these uh, people that you were interviewing, but was there anyone in particular that stood out who really helped you the most along the way? When I first started the True NYC, the TV show and, and the website, I started doing some first interviews and putting it out there. Um, and, and I got a reach out from a guy named Richard Banfield. And he said, look, I have a web development company, web design company. I'm also trying to start something called Startup Business School. I love what you're doing. He was very sick, you know, for me, it was more, way more successful in a real business and he's doing a lot of stuff. And he's like, I love what you're doing. Your site sucks. And the way you're putting it out there, it sucks. Here's what I want to do. I believe in you. I saw, he's like, I watched one of your interviews and it's probably one of the best interviews I've seen in terms of the questions and, and the information you got out. I want to rebuild your website for free. And I was like, okay, and what do you want in return? He was like, I just want nothing. I just want you to continue doing what you're doing. So I was a little skeptical, but I said, okay. And within a month or two, he did exactly that. And not only did he help me build my, my website, we kept our relationship strong in terms of what we were doing and what I was building. And he, his belief in me and what I was doing with True NYC really pushed me to the next level because not only did the site look better, I, I had somebody who was successful as an entrepreneur in my corner. And so, uh, you know, about a little under a year later, when I had the idea to do Lawline, I knew I had to rebuild the website. Mm. And I never met Richard in person. We just spoke over the phone. And he was in Boston. I was in New York. So I, I decided to get on a, one of those $20 buses from Chinatown 
and go up to Boston to, to meet him. But I, I did it under the guise that I wanted to interview him. By the way, this is like pre-podcast, right? I wanted to interview him for the TV show. So I brought my camera, I interviewed him. It went really well. And I just wanted to make sure like the guy on the phone was the same guy in person and he was. And then I told him what I was trying to do with Law on, and I said, I, I want to hire you to, to build the site because you know, the, you're the person that would do it. He said yes. And several months later, we had a, a mock up of our first site. And as they say, the, the rest is, is history. And we not only have we kept in touch, he was in, I'm in Barcelona right now. He was in Spain uh, when I first moved here. He had traveled here with his son. And I saw on, on you know, Instagram that he was here. And I said, I'm here. He, he came to my apartment. He was my first a visitor. Uh, and we were on our, my, my terrace celebrating just sort of how our lives merge back together again. That's beautiful. Uh, what a story. And <laughs> the $20 mega, mega bus ticket too is also fun. Uh, what, you know, as you were doing kind of creating your own uh, education, kind of just, I know your company, Dave, is, is in the education space. Uh, but while you were getting your own education, I mean, and you were interviewing all these people, uh, figuring out maybe how to stand out on your own, uh, what, what were some of the things that you were learning? Were some of these interviews very formulating in your process and, and kind of development? I mean, what, what was going on uh, in these interviews? How did you find people at the time to reach out to and, and ask to interview in the first place? Yeah, so I started with, of course, my own network, as we all do. And I, I got a handful of interviews really quickly, and some of people were really successful. So that helped get to the next round. And then the next round, before you know it, you got to people who are you know, pretty big, like Simon Sinek. Um, there is some people who, you know, maybe not well known, but like Ryan Atlas, who now has, he still had eye contact. He sold his email provider for $170 million. He was like 25 years old. I learned a lot from, I've learned a lot from all different Peter Hoffman, just d different entrepreneurs who said yes. Um, ben Lear, who now he was from Thrillist. He was just starting Thrillist at the time. So I had all these like really interesting people who were like, Many of them have become super successful and I take credit, I guess, from, from the interviews, but like I learned a lot and uh, yeah, they did become formulaic uh, in a way, um, but I did get five main learnings from these interviews and it was these learnings that I actually used to apply to my business and my life. And I, for that, for that it was successful, but that wasn't even the best part. Uh, the best part was the network and the connections and the relationships that I made. That, that I, I'm talking to you today because of True NYC and those interviews. The, that's how far out that path. You know, maybe another tree branch would have led us together, like by fate. But that tree branch has led us together right now. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, it's it's cool how you. I, I kind of look at networking and building relationships like a mountain. And there's people at different rungs. And if you get to one rung, you can get to the next and the next and the next. So it sounds like you're able to, to do that. And, and that education obviously has paid off with Lawline. And for those listening that don't know David, David was extremely influential in helping me get our business off the ground um, and, and being a part of that. So, you know, David, thank you for, for all that help sincerely. Um, and then let's, Dave, so let's be clear though. You, I, I hired Brian to help me. Uh, market my book, The Fast Forward Mindset. And Brian was just getting started and we connected right away. And Brian not only helped me market it, but he helped me edit the final version and really help it get to the level. So I'm forever grateful for, for that experience. Like to me, that's like running a marathon together. We suffered together and we put that together. And that means that, that meant so much to me. So like, and that's the type of person you are. Like, obviously now you're a little bit more busy. So I don't think you can do that for all your clients anymore, but at least <laughs> back then you knew what you needed to do uh, to get to get it going. Yeah, absolutely. It's about rolling up the sleeves and it was an incredible experience to do it with you. So when I trade it for the world. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Dave, um, okay, so, Richard helped you build a law line. I mean, would love to know um, what the, tell us what the company is about and 
And I would love to know more about the, you know, I know about it, but I'd love for you to tell the audience too about the book and, and kind of how what you learned building Lawline and some of these lessons helped kind of create a catalyst for, for driving this book forward. So I know that's a pretty loaded question to share two you huge know, life yeah. moments, but uh, no, no, I'll, do it as, I'll do it as quick as possible and you can tell me where you want me to go. Cool. Um, just to be clear, Lawline, we are the largest provider of online continuing legal education in the country. And just to give you some depth of what that means, uh, since 2006, we have 5 million credits that have been completed on our sites, which are what attorneys need to keep their uh, uh, education after they have their uh, license. And about 150,000 attorneys have done that. And every day we do real up-to-date content. What, what the book is about was my journey as a leader and as an individual growing the company. And it is such a, being an entrepreneur, you are like at the forefront of stress, uncertainty, uh, fear, focus, all those things that you need in your life. And it's sort of, at, at, you got to do it all at once. And one of the things that I realized is I had a lot of walls that kind of came to me. Some I broke through and some I couldn't. But the book is about, for me and for everybody else, is looking back now when I've had some success, is what do I need to do over the next 20 years so I can look back and have no regrets? And so I created the fast forward mindset framework. Uh, and the two main things about it, and then we'll stop here, is it's how to be as fearless and focused as you can be on a daily basis, but also on a larger picture. And the second thing that I found was key to that is instead of focusing on the achievements that I wanted, I started focusing on the impact that I wanted to have on others. And I think now, more than ever, what's going on in the world, impact is, you know, such an, a key thing that we all need, that we all need to focus on. And the reason impact helps is because when you, when you look at impact, you're less concerned about failure because you're thinking about the outside and what you can do for others. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Dave, you know, as you, you develop this, this framework, you're able to develop it because on your journey of becoming an entrepreneur on from your past kind of jobs and kind of your just your life you encountered a set of a set of walls that eventually you had to overcome so for those out there listening who are maybe young professionals who are looking to do something different entrepreneurs a couple of years into their journey you know what were one two three of those walls that were huge kind of hurdle moments for you that you know allowed you to maybe put the book together in a way that you did in such an authentic raw way to help other people through a very specific framework. Yeah. So that's great. Great. So I can do that and, and kind of take you through the steps with each wall that I face. Yeah, let's, and let's, let's, let's th th this is an example of a wall, but as an entrepreneur and an individual, you know, there's 17 different walls, but I'm going to choose the most prevalent ones. So the first wall I had was different times I needed to take action to getting out of my comfort zone. And the biggest struggle that I had in taking action was making a damn decision. And I would get stuck so many times about making a decision because I was afraid I was going to make the wrong decision. And so you don't know if it's going to be wrong or right. And sometimes you just wait and weeks go by and I'll share two things that will help you make decisions faster. One is using the phrase good thing, bad thing, who knows? As you know, that's a key component and it's not something I made up. It's been around for thousands of years, but it's a way to not label your decision or the outcome of your decision as good or bad because we tend to label something bad 20 times more than we label good. And if you're afraid that getting on this podcast, I'm gonna sound like an idiot, um, I'm never gonna get on. So regardless of how I sound at the end and what happens, Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. Who knows? And that's an example, a small example of how you make a decision to go on the podcast. Moving to Barcelona, is it going to be good or bad? Who knows? And that's how you're able to just move forward versus, I don't know, I'm going to be far from my company, I'm be far from my family. Is it going to work? Is it not going to work? So you can move forward. And then something, something my dad told me is in 50 years from now, whatever decision that's in your head is going to mean nothing. It's going to be pointless. You know, like, oh, and you're able to sort of move that faster. So, so you got to make the decision to get out of your comfort zone. So that's the first wall that everyone faces. The second wall that everyone faces is you've made the decision, you've moved to Barcelona, 
you started your business, you've hired people, you've done the podcast, a month or two goes into it, you're like, what have I done? I don't know what I'm doing here. I, I don't know what these two people I just hired, what, how to manage them or how to go about that. And all you want to do is retreat and you want to go back into, be, I wish I can go back to before I made that decision. I shouldn't have hired that person. And so you got to nip fear in the bud. And, and NIP is an acronym that I went through, which is, no, you're not alone. No, you'll get through it and you need to play the part. And one thing I, I could tell you is m many times, you know, when there, there's, there's a stress that you, when, you, when you, you're in that moment, you just, you wake up in the morning and you're, I'm sure you've had this, your heart starts beating, you're sweating and you're stressed and you're not even sure why you're stressed. You, you know what I mean? Um, have you had that recently? When's the last I, time you had it? Last night? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> probably two months, two or three months ago when this pandemic yeah. happened. Right. So that, but I know in my conversations with you, like you've had a couple big sort of inflection points in your business where you had to, you started sweating and you yep. had to figure out how to do things. And so what I just wanted to provide somebody with is everybody goes through that. And there's four things that you can do to get out of that on, on the pinch. And I'm just going to share one of them right now because uh, in the essence of time and uh, it's filling your bucket. And, and what I mean by filling your bucket is you need to uh, take a pause and look at your friend, Brian, and say, Brian, I'm really, ex when you fill your, first of all, when you fill a bucket, uh, the number one thing to, to do is you need to fill someone else's bucket. And by filling someone's buckets, you actually give them positive reinforcement on how they're doing. Like, this is a great podcast. I think you've done a really good job at, at moving it forward. Because when you're giving someone reinforcement, you actually feel positive energy yourself. And sometimes when you're going through that stress of, did I hire that person? Look to the person you've hired, give them positive reinforcement. And it'll give you positive energy to help you at that moment to get through that stress. And sometimes you just need to get through that stress. Hmm. Um, do you want me, I feel like I've gone long for those two. I can go to the third wall or I can pause right here. Yeah. Yeah. I would say what would be really cool is, is tell us, tell us the third. And then I'd love to maybe you take us through an example, maybe in the book, but uh, like your COO that you had to let go or one of those experiences where you kind of have to take the framework and put it to action. So tell us the third step and then let's hear a story around it. That was deep, deeply impactful. Yeah. Third and final is, you know, you, you decided not to fire the person you hired because you, you, you got through that moment of fear and now you're, you're kind of nervous because you have to focus. What's the plan? You know, you just talked about your focus and how, how you're building that structure. And I'm just going to give one uh, example of, of giving focus and that's keeping the agreements that you've set. And it, it sounds simple and sounds, okay, what does that mean? But many times we commit to things with other people or with ourselves that we break. And one of the things I heard early on was uh, uh, from Jack Canfield, the success principles is you need to keep your agreements as if your son's or daughter's life was on the line. Mm -hmm. And if you keep your agreements as if someone you love's life's on the line, not only do you make less agreement, agreements, you see it through to the end. And at the time when I read that, I was breaking, like I was shouldn't, canceling meetings. I was not taking care of my health. And so I put that to the test and I used that to run my first couple of marathons, which I never ran before. And so to me, that was just a real example of, I started doing that and then applying, you know, the basic goals and dates to things. But uh, it, it really helps you when there's that wall in front of you. If you know you're going to keep that agreement, it's the number one thing to give you the focus to break through it. So for an example, uh, it, what's interesting is, uh, going through, let's say my COO example is I had three different COOs in six years, literally every two years, COO failure, COO failure. And I, I couldn't figure out what was going on or why, but I knew that that, that structure had to change. And so I decided uh, that I needed to, to sort of circle back and I hired, I took the risk, I took action, right? My action was hiring a coach to work with my company. The fear that I had after I hired the coach was it cost a lot of money, a lot of money, more than I expected to pay, but I, I, I went forward with that. And so as soon as I did that, I'm, I started thinking to myself, 
I don't know if this is the right thing or what we're going to do. Uh, but then I said, I'm not alone. This is what all I spoke to so many entrepreneurs who've done what I've done. Of course, I did references. And then finally, the coach himself provided me with the structure and focus using the scaling up framework. And this is Mark Green, who you know very well, who he provided us focus for our company and our business, which is the same thing that a marathon training plan provides for a marathoner. And using that helped us build a foundation to where we are today. So that's a, uh, a quick example. I and mean, it goes in obviously more detail in the book. Yeah. It's really neat to kind of just hear, hear you walk us through. I think for the people listening, right? Uh, especially who want to focus, who want to take action, who, who don't know how to overcome fear. And you know, these are, I think, really core principles that you, you just aren't taught. I think these are experience teaches us these things if we, and if we have the frameworks and tools to kind of move past these experiences, you're saying kind of, here's a framework. And I think a lot of people right out of the gate as a young entrepreneur, as a young professional who really want to uh, find a, a, just a different path. That's not conventional, like, you know, sales shop, you know, it's like, what do you do in these moments? What do you do when your back is against the wall or you're scared to death to make a decision you know, you, you've provided something very valuable, I think that can really help and are all entrepreneurs on the journey. So I think it's universal uh, to help make decisions and get, get through things that are really hard. And I think the work uh, has really made an impact with a lot of people. So I really appreciate you sharing anything else on, on that that you want to give context to. I'll, I'll say this, look, there's so many quote unquote frameworks out there. And I've realized that in my own research and talking to so many people, and you, you just got to find the right one that fits you. I'll tell you this, there is the number one customer of this framework for writing this book was me. And to be honest, I figured the best way to have impact on others is to, you know, to eat my own dog food. And so three examples, as soon as I started doing this was applying the framework I became president of the entrepreneurs organization, something I was so afraid of doing and didn't want to do for years. But I said, well, let me use the framework and do it because it's going to have the biggest impact on entrepreneurs. I actually wrote the book, you know, and I not only researched it, but I, I literally applied the framework in writing the book. And then the third and final one, which is where I am today is I moved my family to Barcelona for the year because we always had a desire to explore the world and give our, our children that opportunity. And again, this is all about not in 20 years, not looking back with regrets. And uh, sometimes you, it's the vision you have in your head, you're just not sure how to do it. And the framework for me allowed me to take those little steps to move forward. And I really hope they can do for other people. And I, and I started doing webinars. There's actually a fast forward mindset plan that takes 10 minutes to fill out. And there's a Google doc that maybe you can link on here that anyone who fills it out, it's designed for you to, to do it in 10 minutes or less and be able to start working on a goal right away. Yeah, that's fantastic, uh, David. And, and something that I think has been a constant theme throughout this interview is there's, there's been a kind of an educational component to your kind of entire life. And I'll bring this around in a second with a question, but you know, with your, your initial sales jobs, it was kind of looking at where you were and, and kind of realizing what you were learning and tapping out and thinking about what was next. It was, you know, going to law school and thinking about where you were learning, applying the interviews and kind of at every step you've taken what you've learned, applied it to the next, but also have kind of looked back and made, made different decisions that are scarier at every turn, um, but it pushed you continually outside your comfort zone. Uh, and with that, typically to make those decisions, as you've talked about, you've talked about people, some books, um, you know, you, you're, you're constantly educating your own self and going out of your way to apply to your own life. So as you've been on this journey yourself, beyond the book that you created for other people, what, what are some, con what's con some content resources, materials that you have read over the years uh, that have been deeply impactful to how you navigate the world and, and the frameworks in which you see the world through? So... Three books that, so books have been super impactful on me. And one thing I just wanted to say when I heard you saying all that, looking back on my life, whether intentional or unintentional, about every five years or so, I make a big change. And I started to feel that, you know, we had this beautiful house that we bought, you've been there and it was really great. And we were living the life. We were exactly where we wanted to be, but it started to feel too routine to me. 
And the same thing that happened in my sales jobs. And so I, I'm constantly, routine sets you free, but also routine can hold you back. So I think that's just a good uh, guiding point for other people. Think about your life in these five-year clips and like how to make sure that when you look back in five years, what, are, what is different? What have you changed structurally, at least tried in that five years, even if you go back to where you were, that you can use that, or even three years. It doesn't have to be as long as five. But sometimes people think you have to make every year, every day. It, it could be two or three big things. So book number one is How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie. Book number two, and I have a reference of all the books that have impacted me in the back of my book uh, in the index. Book number two is The Success Principles by Jack Canfield. And book number three is The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod, who actually ended up writing the forward for my book because we became close after the, the impact the book had on me. I reached out to him and tried to help him share his impact with the world. And he didn't need my help because he's sold more than a million copies of his book. But when I reached out to him, he was only about 10,000 copies. So he's gone a, a long way pretty, you know, in a, about eight years. Wow. That's my dream. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, there's a way out there. Uh, I think Hal's a great example for you. Um, in terms of, I mean, just, I think with that said, I think similar to you, David, I had a lot of very influential books at the start of my career that I think serve as guiding principles for me today that I latched onto right away and, and the value of content and the right resources at the right time uh, really think can lead to these exponential breakthroughs and growth or big five-year changes that you're referencing. Uh, David, something that you mentioned earlier in this and then through our conversations, you've, you've talked about this, this moment um, with, your, with your dad sitting on the back porch and it's kind of this imaginary, imaginary, not imaginary, but it's this real moment of looking back on your life and what, what you want to tell yourself and just this like father son moment of being proud. Like I would love for you to share that with the audience to kind of bring us home. Uh, and then we'll tell them where to find you, but may, maybe share the, share that story. Uh, Cause I think it's a really powerful and strong. Yeah. So as I said, my dad has been a strong mentor for me uh, ever since being an entrepreneur as he, he just sort of helped me dig deep. And I think I was about 40 years old or, and I was having one of those low moments that we have as entrepreneurs, but don't talk about so often. And I was just telling my dad, I was like, I was sick of feeling like a failure every day. And like, I don't know, I felt like I said I was gonna work out and I didn't, or I thought my business should be bigger than it was, or I'd be more accomplished. And he just heard all that and he just kind of like, like looked at me and he's like, Dave, you don't know how good you are. Like, look, what we're sitting in the house of your dreams. Look at the business you built. Look what you've done. And he, and, and he said that to me and I sort of was like, ah, oh, yeah, 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 thanks. Because, you know, we all, I think probably you're similar. Like nobody does well with somebody like giving them a compliment, even their dad. And he's like, no, you're not listening to me. Like, you don't know how good you are. And, like, and he said it again. It just reminded me of a conversation literally a month before I had with my wife she was sitting in her bedroom crying and she was crying, not because the kids or anything. She was crying because she had to do a presentation for work. And I, and I knew her problem wasn't focused because I heard her practicing it time and time again. And she was perfect. And I was like, I was like asking her like, what are you afraid of? And she's like, well, I'm afraid if I get up there, they're going to realize that I'm a fraud. And I've been a fraud for the past 14 years at my job. Let me just explain something to you. My wife, was one of the top people as a social worker at our hospital. She was awarded social worker of the year. She was handpicked for the position she was in. And I got like chills when she said that. I was like, Cal, you don't know how good you are. You're really good at that. And when my dad said it to me, and then I remembered saying to my, my, my to Kelly, my wife, I was like, it's not just Kelly. It's not just me. We all don't know how good we are. And of course, that's, you know, the imposter syndrome. And that, that's, you know, having that confidence in ourselves is one of the things that holds us back from, from taking action to get out of our comfort zone more often than not. Mm. I just got chills listening. And I've heard that cool. story before. And you heard it before. So, so good. <laughs> so I think a lot of other people will get chills. Uh, David, this has been so impactful. You're, you said it as like the intro clip or whatever. Oh, I, I, it's <laughs> so funny you say that. My mind was, I, I made a mental note. I was like, 346 is you 344 to 346 eastern time um but oh, i right. did i actually was I, I was right there with you um 
Perfect. Uh, but Dave, you, David, you have been one of the most impactful people in my life. Um, I think will always will be. Um, so thank you for everything you've done, what you represent, what you've built, and um, what you'll continue to do and how you'll make your impact. Where, where can other people uh, who aren't as familiar with you yet find you, reach out to you? What's the best protocol? Yes, I'll say that. I just want to say one thing to you is, you know, as I started looking at the other podcast interviews, clearly you have a knack for attracting mentors to you in one form or another because you've attract, you know, you've had a lot of great people who've helped you out in your career. So it's super cool. And so I think, you know, people can learn just from listening to these interviews on and how to attract the right people and and, and put that forward. And for me, like go to fastforwardmindset.com. Google my name, David Schnurman. I think because of you, I have over 35 podcasts in the past year, uh, maybe 40. You'll see a bunch of stuff on there, but you can just go to LinkedIn. You can email me at david at lawline.com um, and you know, check out the book, listen to it or buy it on, online. And uh, I'm here to help. Great. Well, David, thank you. I uh, look forward to sharing this with the world. Me too. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, I hope you leave a review on the platform of your choice and share it with a friend who you think would find it valuable. If you'd like to receive our written newsletter and thought leadership, head on over to bwmissions.com backslash newsletter and subscribe. See you on the next show.